All right, so we are going to get started. Uh, we've got uh, Adam Wallenkopf from Esri. He's going to talk about applying geospatial analytics at a massive scale using Kafka Spark Elasticsearch on DCOS. All right, thank, thank you, Ravi. Can you guys hear me okay? We're all good? All right. So I'm Adam Allenkoff. I work at a company called Esri. Uh, we're based out of Redlands, California, which is just like an hour and a half east of here, or if you traveled yesterday morning, three hours uh, to get here in the traffic. Uh, so uh, uh, we're here local. Uh, I'm going to be talking about applying geospatial analytics uh, at massive scale, uh, talking about some of the things we've done at Esri. Uh, and I've got a really cool companion GitHub site, uh, along with some of the things that you'll see here where you can go to, to learn a lot more than what we'll be able to cover just on this 40 minutes that we have today. So I'm responsible for the real time and the big data capabilities at Esri. So this basically means the IoT strategy that we have as a company, bringing in sensor data and other things. Uh, Esri as a company, uh, in case you're not familiar with us, we've been around since 69. Uh, we're one of the the largest companies that do geographic uh, software or spatial software, if you want to call it that. Uh, we pretty much invented uh, geospatial uh, information systems uh, back in the late 60s. A lot of the origin original folks that did that are still with the company. Uh, we license our software to over 350,000 user organizations around the world. Uh, so we make geospatial software. This isn't really a session about Esri. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background in case you didn't know who we are. As far as the agenda for this uh, discussion today, I'm gonna to talk about the emergence of a new class of problem that's driving us to have to take a new architectural approach uh, from what we've done in the past with geospatial. Uh, we'll talk about our approach towards massive scale, which is obviously using DCOS and a number of the packages in the ecosystem of Mesosphere. Uh, we'll talk about geospatial analytics. I'll give you a few samples of some of the types of analytics that we perform. Uh, on this for our customers. And then we'll talk about uh, an important topic, which is writing our applications in a way that they can be portable across multiple environments. If that's public cloud, private cloud, on-premise, and how we can use DCOS as the way to deliver those in a consistent way. So uh, this is uh, a slide that kind of captures the essence of what we're kind of seeing in the space uh, over the last few years. And so we have traditional customers that have been doing uh, what we call real-time GIS, where they might track their snow plows, their police vehicles, their fire equipment, uh, other things that, that are out there. But they typically, a few years ago, were only tracking you know, one or two assets. And what we're seeing now is we have cities like Dubai and Singapore and, and other places around the world that are pretty much tracking everything. And so these are a sampling of some of the, the things that our customers uh, track on a continuous basis. Each of these uh, signals comes from different devices that are out in the field. Uh, they report lots of different information, uh, be it from an environmental sensor reporting air quality or water quality, uh, be it weather events and trying to correlate that to uh, things that are happening inside of a, a company. And basically, they want to be able to bring all of this information in in near real time as quickly as possible, visualize this and have a situational awareness display of what's going on. And then they can use that as a common operational picture to uh, affect uh, different things. So more recently in the, the last couple weeks, some of the hurricanes, we've had people fielded down on site, uh, tracking the water levels, tracking all kinds of other things, helping FEMA and other organizations to, to respond to those situations. So with this is bringing a new velocity of data. It's not just one feed of vehicles coming in, it's all of these different feeds uh, providing that. And what we've traditionally done for customers is deliver uh, a multi-machine uh, system uh, for these customers. And this is a kind of our old approach before DCOS. And so we would recommend an environment where people bring in and ingest this real-time data uh, using our, our software, store this data in a spatial temporal way, spatial temporal being recording that data based on space and time and having it optimized to be able to access that data that way. And then being able to run ad hoc and scheduled analytics on that data or those observations that are stored. And then finally, being able to visualize that information, either as a live display or a kind of DVR, you know, go rewind what happened an hour ago, what happened two days ago, what happened a year ago. And so this is a traditional deployment uh, that we've had. And what we're seeing now is with this emergent, emergence of IoT is that we're seeing a new class of customers that go well beyond that. So they can't just use a few machines and, and process thousands of events per second. We have customers that need to do millions of events per second, potentially, uh, depending on all the different feeds that they have. And just taking our traditional architecture and trying to deploy that across tens or hundreds or thousands of machines is not really a reasonable or tenable thing to do. 
And so this requires a new approach for this. And our massive scale approach is uh, DCOS. So if you took the concept of a data center or a rack of machines in a data center and treated that as one logical unit, uh, we would treat this as one operating system, thus the data center operating system. And what we look at is instead of scheduling our software to run on 11 different machines and we're very specific about this machine is for storage and this machine is for ingestion, we just treat it as one operating system where we schedule work to run. And so we don't look at it as 33 machines. We look at it as a whole bunch of resources that are available that we can schedule work to run on. And so we have a lot of RAM, we have a lot of storage, we have a lot of uh, CPU resources that we can make use of. And then we schedule work to run on that. So this is basically what DCOS is all about. And this has given us a different starting point uh, for us to deploy these applications for customers. And uh, treating the entire data center, not just the 30 nodes as, as one operating system is, is quite useful. Uh, this is not new. This is something that's been proven and out in the industry for some time. These are a listing of some of the companies that have been using the underlying technologies and then DCOS as well as it's emerged over the last year and a half or so. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants that have proven this architecture and we're basically applying our software to it and we're adding Esri to, to this logo as well. So we have a project within Esri uh, that we call Trinity. It's Trinity like the Matrix character. I have the, the fortune of traveling all around the world as, as part of my job. And when I talked about Trinity in Dubai, they were like, cool, like Christianity? No, no, not Christianity. And then I went to Germany and they were like, oh, like the Atomic Bomb Project. Oh, no, no, no. So Trinity has turned out to be the worst name for a project ever, but everybody knows it by that name. So I always qualify it with the Matrix character now. So. That's why we have Trinity from, from the Matrix there. We entered a partnership with uh, Mesosphere about a year and a half, two years ago uh, to work on uh, re-architecting Esri software in a way that we can span this across a massive scale. And so that's what our project Trinity is about. So our before picture looks something like this, where we had this triangle or the Trinity, if you want to call it that, of ingesting real-time data from sensors, storing that data, and then being able to run ad hoc analysis or scheduled analysis on that after the fact, and then being able to visualize that information over time. Our before picture and our scorecard for what we could do with our traditional software stack was uh, in this range here where we could ingest thousands of events per second, which met probably 95% of our users' use cases. But we have that new class of customer that's in the hundreds of thousands or millions of events per second that we need to handle. And then we also, from a streaming analysis and from a batch analysis perspective, need to be able to handle lots more velocity, lots more volume, and store many more than millions of events per second. So our after picture is we needed to move to something that looked like this, where we're satisfying that new class of customer. And for us to do that, we had to re-architect our approach. It wasn't just take our existing so software, put a Docker container around it, and deploy a whole bunch of them. That, that wouldn't really work too well. So we had to re-architect our software, and what we did is we went through a containerization process. And so instead of having a monolithic application, we broke it into small microservices. And so what was our ingestion path has been broken into things that sit there at the edge and collect data. We have Kafka that sits in between. We have Spark streaming jobs, which are the purple items uh, that write to storage systems, which is Elasticsearch. And then we have visualization techniques to do that. What this allows us to do is to scale up any aspect of the system based on a customer's need. So if they're a connected car customer, like you've seen on stage, uh, they have millions of events per second coming in. So they're gonna need lots of black sources to sit at the edge and collect these things and have lots of redundancy, lots of availability in those services. And then lots of Kafka brokers and lots of other things running as well. So we take our before picture, re-architect that into these containers and we have our project Trinity. Uh, which has broken that out into to nice microservices. So these are a listing of some of the container types that we have, uh, and the underlying technology underneath all of those. As I, as I mentioned before, our sources sit at the edge and they uh, are responsible for connecting to some device out in the field. So we have probably 50 or 60 different sources, you know, everything from listen to a live weather feed to listen to connected cars that are streaming in to uh, listening to uh, a, a fleet of you know, FedEx or UPS vehicles or, or things to connect to be able to bring in all, all those different types of, of feeds. So those are uh, connectors or adapters for different device types. Those we write in Scala and we deliver those. So this is kind of the, the, the reactive application style approach. 
we typically write those events to a gateway that is underlying Kafka brokers. Uh, and those topics are available for Spark streaming jobs to consume. And then we have our geospatial analysis capabilities within those real-time analytics. Uh, and this geospatial analysis is stuff that we've added to Spark, so we spent a lot of time over the last two and a half years to add user-defined types for geometry, to add user-defined functions for different operations for, for geospatial, which we'll go through in a second. And then our batch analysis is the same story with user-defined types and user-defined functions in Spark. Uh, we write that data to Elasticsearch. Elastic is really good at storing geospatial data, uh, but we've extended it even further to do additional capabilities. And then we expose all of our uh, data in our spatial temporal store with a play app that's a reactive base application, a web app that people can access and generate map images and visualize things, which we'll see a cool demo of in a minute. Our geospatial analytics, just to give you a quick sampling, uh, we're gonna deep dive into these two container types, uh, is those Spark things that we we're talking about. So it's, it's Spark with Esri extensions that we've written. Uh, and these are a sampling of some of the different analytics that we have. So I'm not gonna cover all of these, but uh, we have you know, capabilities such as aggregate points, where I might want to take observational data from sensors, and they may be moving sensors, and I wanna record you know, I don't wanna put a million dots on the map. I wanna be able to see the density of those things, and I wanna see that in near real time as it's moving around. So the aggregate points would allow us to do that. Um, we can also do things like join features. And so when we join features, it's kinda of like a relational database join, but it's joining with space and time as well. So which of these dots are in these polygons, and which of these dots are in these polygons within this time window? So being able to do spatial temporal joins. There's a lot of other analytic capabilities that we're not gonna go through in this session, but uh, this is just a sampling of, of a few of those. So a couple of real world concrete examples of, of these analytics are uh, like which crime events occurred near sporting events spatially and temporally. So that might be a question that somebody wants to, to ask to do that. Or what bodies of water intersect cities with populations greater than a million people? And that million people could actually be not demographic data, but real-time cellular phone data that's coming in. So I have a million people here right now because I have anonymized cell phone data feeds that are coming in. So that can work with real-time data or static data or data that's changing on, on a continuous basis. Or another example is what traffic jams occurred because of car accidents. So how can I correlate these things? What was the weather like when those car accidents happened? So how do I correlate all these things together to do that? So this is, uh, if we go into that tool a little bit more, uh, what a user specifies is what type of uh, input they have. So it might be, let's say, cell phone data. And that cell phone data, I wanna, I wanna join into maybe zip codes or province boundaries or things of that nature, or maybe operational boundaries for my company or my organization. The output that I wanna get is a poly polygon that represents here's the count uh, of those things. And so, uh, we can do this by any combination of space, time, or attribute. Uh, and these are part of the user-defined functions that we've added to Spark, so that's why it says powered by, by Esri. Uh, and so we have temporal operators, uh, so there's 13 or so of these. Uh, we took these from the David Luckham book, if you guys are into those things. Uh, but these are the temporal operators that we've added, and then we also have a bunch of spatial operators, and you can combine these in any form or fashion that you like to do pretty sophisticated analysis. To expand on the temporal operators a bit more, this is kind of a visual depiction of it. So I can ask, did this weather event, occur, did it begin a car accident or did it intersect or uh, did it coincide with uh, a car accident that happened? And so you can start to really do sophisticated analysis with these things. Another tool that we have is aggregate points. And so this is what a lot of people like to start with just to understand their data. So I have all this, you know, billions of observations of sensors that are out there. Maybe it's cell phone data, maybe it's uh, car movement. And so what does my data look like? I just want to plot it against zip codes or other boundaries that I have. And so, uh, or I could do things like where are the most power outages occurring because of the hurricane? So if I have a feed of that information, I can look at that. Or what zip codes have the highest uh, count of crimes and incidents? And again, that could be a real-time feed coming in. So those are some of the, the examples. Uh, to aggregate points, uh, we pretty much take point data or observational data. I apologize for why that's flickering, I have no idea. Uh, but the aggregate points takes observation data 
and it joins it into polygons or, or other features that you have, and then it results with a polygon that's uh, densified. So you can see the counts of those things being, you know, red being more incidence or blue being less incidence of that. This can be done on a two-dimensional basis, uh, which is kind of described here. Uh, if you don't have polygons that you want to join with, you can join this into just bins. So I could say aggregate uh, this cell phone movement in this mall to a 10 meter resolution. And so I could say I want 10 meter bins, and that's what the top picture is showing. And so I can do that in a two-dimensional space. Or what's more interesting is I can actually do this in a three-dimensional space where the third dimension is time. And so we call these things space-time cubes. And so you can take this uh, data and add a time dimension to it and say for every hour of the day, so 24 different vertical dimensions, I wanna see the distribution of data and how it's occurred over time. So this might be population movement, it might be other things that you wanna, wanna consider. And to, to blow your mind a little bit further, you could even do this not just into cubes, but into uh, volumes. So volumes being polygons or other things. So these could be zip code boundaries or some other kind of shape that you, you draw and you wanna do some analysis on. So to kind of explain this a little bit more, I'm gonna show you a quick little video demo of uh, a project that we have. This is uh, data from a, a business partner of ours called SafeGraph. It's anonymized cell phone data in New York City. And what we're looking at here is uh, some analysis that we pre-computed. And so these mobile phone, this is mobile phone activity in Manhattan. And we can slide through time through this little time slider on the bottom here. And you can see the density of things. So we're extruding the values based on the counts of mobile phones uh, that are being counted at that particular time. We can do this by aggregating the data into bins or into triangles or hexagons or even cylinders. And so these are some of the extensions that we've done on top of Elasticsearch uh, to be able to aggregate by other types of shapes. What's another interesting view of this is uh, viewing this in kind of a, what we call a space-time ripple surface. And so the space-time ripple surface uh, is, is exactly kind of like what it describes, where we're kind of depicting the, the volume of the data based on where it is. Shoot, I don't know why that's flickering. But as I span through time here, I can see you know, vertically where most of the density is occurring in this. So these, this is just another nice way to visualize this information and see where the distribution of this data was. I could further drill into this and say, just show me Android users or show me iPhone users or show me users that are greater than 30 years old. So I could be interactive with this and, and change this on the fly. Uh, to add that temporal dimension that we were talking about before, uh, we can go into a small little study area here. And so we might wanna know over time, what was the mobile phone uh, population in this specific area? So as I slide through time here, what I'm gonna see is vertically, I'm seeing the different time dimensions. So these are different hours of the day or different days of the week uh, based on what's occurring. And so we can kind of pan around this area and interact with this. And then we can also change the, the visualization into the different shapes that we've uh, indexed inside of our storage. So this is just a nice, cool way to, to visualize the data. It's very interactive. People can do queries against this stuff and, and do kind of what if scenarios against it. So that one's not open source, I, sorry for that. I wish I could give that one away. So I'm gonna shift into a, a slightly different topic now, which is deployment portability. And so this deployment portability is, this is what a, a cluster ends up looking like when we deploy this for, for, a, for a user. And so we take our containers and then based on that user's need, we deploy different number of instances of these things out. And so we can, we can define you know, each of these Spark streaming jobs is gonna consume two or three cores and it's gonna have X amount of RAM, but I want 20 of those to run in this cluster because it's a connected car scenario and there's lots of data feeding in. Uh, and I need lots of black sources to sit at the edge and be able to handle the events that are coming through. And then I need lots of storage data nodes so that I can store this data. And then finally, I, I need visualization tasks that are running so that people can query a web app and generate the, the rendering that I was showing in the, the thing that we just looked at a minute ago. And so this is what an end cluster looks like. So this is uh, with our Esri software working. I wanted to give you guys something that you could play around with. So what I did is I created this uh, project called DCOS IoT Demo. Uh, that's the GitHub link up above and the pictures that are there are what I could give away as, as part of open source. 
And I basically abstracted away all of our Esri proprietary stuff out of this and said, what if I just took Scala, Kafka, Spark, Elasticsearch, and Play? I don't have a cool SMAC acronym. I don't know, maybe you could come up with an acronym for those things. Uh, but uh, this is basically using these underlying technologies uh, without any kind of proprietary Esri stuff in it, just to give you an example of here's how you can connect all these things together to build an application on top of DCOS. And so, um, I don't have enough time in this session to actually go through the, the demo uh, to do this, but there's a video and a number of other things up on that repo that you can kind of walk through this. But what I wanted to describe is that when we ship this to a user, our users kind of dictate, I want this to run on Amazon, or I want this to run on Azure, or I want this to run on the GovCloud, on a C2S environment for, uh, for the government, or I want it to run even on-premise, because I have my own hardware, my own data center to do this. So we don't really have the luxury to say, we deliver the software and we deliver it on Amazon, and that's it, and that's the only environment we have to support. So one of the, the key benefits of using DCOS and selecting that as a, as a way to package our software and deliver it to customers is that it makes it so that we can make this portable across multiple different uh, infrastructures. And so as Toby and other folks were kind of pointing out this morning, it's for real. And this, this DCOS IoT demo kind of walks through the installation steps on how to do that in various different environments. So if you go to that project, uh, what you'll see is eight or so steps on how to get this uh, environment together. And number one is you know, how to deploy this across different environments. So the Azure, Amazon, and on-premise has some pretty decent documentation around it. C2S is, is coming soon, uh, but that's you know, a very specialized thing. So if you want to talk more about that, let me know. Uh, but we, we have very good documentation up here. It's step by step, you know, it'll probably take you a couple days to walk through this tutorial and stand up the environment for yourself. Uh, but it's, it's all available there. Uh, it goes through all the steps and I'm just gonna visually kind of walk through what, what happens. And so to provision this environment to uh, any of these different providers, really the only thing that's cloud specific or provider specific is the first step, which is provisioning your actual resources. So when you go to Azure or Amazon, there's different ways to do that. For Azure, uh, there's a thing called ARM templates. So those are like the cloud formation templates inside of Amazon. So you would define an Azure template. We actually created an ARM template. David in the audience, part of my team, created this really cool ARM template that'll allow you to just type in, I want three masters, 30 pr uh, private agents, and three public agents, and boom, you've got a resource that looks like this. Uh, if you do it on Amazon, there's cloud formation templates. If you do it on C2S, it's cloud formation templates, but it's an off off offline system in a disconnected environment. And then if you want to do it on-premise, it's basically IT administrators setting up this environment. And so uh, there's a lot of steps to do it on-premise if you want to do that. And we've taken a first attempt at documenting what those are, uh, but the Mesosphere documentation has comprehensive information about that as well. But basically this is the only step that's different depending on the infrastructure. And so once you have this resources in place and all the prerequisites in place, everything is the same regardless of what infrastructure you're using. So to install DCOS, uh, we took the Mesosphere installation templates and kind of generalized them a bit more. Uh, and basically uh, we copy up those up. These come from that GitHub site. So I'm just copying up my uh, private key and my, my credentials and I'm copying up the installation script, and this installation script is part of the, the project that's uh, the repo that we shared. And so once I have that, I SSH into the boot node. The boot node is uh, one of the administrative nodes that allows me to actually install DCOS and, and manage the, the infrastructure. And so once I do that, then I just basically run a, an installation script and I give it an argument of how many masters I want, how many private agents I want, how many public uh, agents that I want to be in my environment. And when I do that, uh, it asks me what type of DCOS installation do I want? Do you want the latest uh, open source version? Do you want an enterprise version? Which version do you want? And so you can type in a URL if you want a specific enterprise version, and then you put your credentials in, and then voila, it installs this. So to provision the, to provision the actual machines on Amazon or Azure, it takes about three to four minutes to spin up 30 nodes, so it doesn't really take too long. Uh, and to run this installation script and lay down bare bones DCOS, Mesos, Marathon, everything else that comes along with it takes another six or seven minutes. So within 10 minutes, you can have a 30 node DCOS cluster uh, at your disposal to start doing things with. 
after this happens, it runs through and it tells you what your masters are, uh, and then it tells you some stats about how long it took. And so this one took about seven minutes or so. At that point, we have a DCOS environment that's ready to go, and we don't really have any services deployed to that. So what's running is all the agents have mesos loaded on them, all of the masters are ready to go, they're participating in a quorum, uh, and then Marathon is available and all the other frameworks that are in the universe uh, are available for use within this environment. And so the, the next step as part, of, as part of our demo app that we have is to install Kafka. And so you can select, you go to universe and install Kafka and you say, I wanna have a five broker system. You specify the cores, the RAM, the et cetera that you want. And then a few seconds, couple minutes later, you have a five broker system in that environment. Similarly, uh, Elasticsearch uh, is part of the Elastic package. So you can go to uh, the universe and install Elastic and you'll get the whole Elk stack. You'll get the log stash, you'll get Kibana if you wanna install that. You'll get all the other parts of the Elk stack as well. But you get data nodes of Elasticsearch and you can specify how many data nodes you want, what size of allocation you wanna give to, to each of those as far as RAM and storage and everything else. Uh, and then you can spin that up. So this is, you know, another couple minutes later, you have a 10 node Elasticsearch cluster. So now we're at about 15 minutes. So we're doing pretty good. So if you try to do this by hand, it would take you days probably. Uh, and then we can deploy our reactive web app. So uh, once a developer has kind of written this app, it's pretty easy, all the source code's available on that repo and you can deploy this uh, reactive play app out there. And this is the app that's gonna allow people to query in and generate the map visualizations that we did before. And then we wanna run some Spark streaming jobs. And again, that Spark streaming job could be sized to have as many instances as you want. In this case, it's five instances. And that Spark streaming job is gonna be listening to topics on Kafka. And then we finally need something to actually write data into Kafka. And so we have a Kafka producer application, uh, what we call a source. And those sources are, are written in Scala. Uh, the source that we give with this repo is uh, just querying a, a big, I think it's a gig and a half CSV file that's on S3, loads it into memory and just starts pushing taxi cab movement events uh, into the, the Kafka system. And so it's a fairly uh, simple source. And at that point we have our, our application running and then we can query this uh, through, through the map interface, hitting the play app, and then we can start to visualize the information and you get these time sliders, you get all kinds of other things that you can play around with the data. So it's a pretty cool uh, sample app. Uh, if you saw the MesosCon keynote last year, we showed a very early form of this uh, back then. Uh, we've since uh, updated uh, this to the latest uh, specs. Uh, DCOS 110 came out last week, so I haven't tested it against that, but I'll do that shortly and make sure it works with 110. Uh, and then you should have an environment to, to play around with and, and do things with. So the, the end result is that you get an interface that looks something like this. You can kind of see a time slider at the bottom. Uh, you can render things in the, the geo hash aggregations is what's on the left. And you can kind of see the density of where it's red is where more, more taxi cabs are moving around at that point in time. And then the yellow uh, is kind of less density. And so you can zoom in, zoom out, it'll, it'll change the shapes based on that. And you'll see different levels of aggregation as you zoom in and zoom out. Uh, and then you can pan through time as well. And if you wanna visualize it as a, as a heat map, what actually happens is the data comes back from Elasticsearch into the client, and then the client generates these heat maps on the client side, and these heat maps can be used to, to visualize the data in a slightly different way. I wish I could give away the, the cool 3D thing that we showed before. So that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to go through in this session. I wanna leave good time for, for Q&A, so we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Is this pretty cool stuff? Yeah? All right, what questions do you have? Yes, sir. If a simulation were to utilize this same data, what would the demands be on, on uh, the, the processing engines that are trying to determine what the effects might be in a certain uh, situation? For instance, if, if, uh, if somebody were to create a 
simulations that say, okay, that the mayor of Houston ordered an evacuation. What would highways look like, given what we know about the, the data from Hurricane Harvey? Would, would the, 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 what I'm trying to figure out is, is the processing engine still real time? Is it something less than real time? Is it something faster? How would that work? So the question is about uh, how do we do simulations? That's kind of the concise way, I think, to, to summarize that. Uh, so uh, simulations can be done as part of the batch analysis, the green things that we have there. And so we, we oftentimes have customers, uh, specifically in the military, that want to do like, what if we go here and do X? You know, what would happen in that scenario? And so they can run kind of these analytics that we have as, as capabilities and then get a result from that. And then if they want to play back that data and kind of see it occur over time, they can feed that data back in through this loop. It's not necessarily real time, but it's simulated data. And they can actually control the velocity of that. So play it back 10 times normal speed, play it back you know, less than normal speed. And so that's typically how folks do that. And simulation is a very big part of, of what we do as well, so of what if analysis, uh, what if this, uh, circumstance that we actually recorded was different? What if we responded sooner? What might have happened with that? What if the water levels rise X amount in the next X minutes? What will that do to affect things? And that's where you see like, here's the floodplain of New York City or something if the water level rises to this level. So yeah, Esri definitely has tools to, to help with that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be real time. It's just a feed of data that you can control back in. Hopefully. Okay. If it's not real time, you can go back in, inside of our tools and actually rewind it through the time sliders and the other things that we have. Uh, but if you want to kind of simulate it as it's happening now and it looks like it's happening now, you would feed it back through this loop and then you can kind of see it over time. Question in the back. So the question is, do we have any challenges deploying Kafka or other things uh, other than just doing it outside of DCOS? No, it's much easier within DCOS, so uh, it gives us a very deterministic way to deliver these brokers. Uh, and it, it does that through the scheduling system of DCOS and Mesos, uh, where it'll actually land on nodes that have availability. And so we don't really have to think about this machine is for Kafka or this machine is for Elasticsearch. We can have a general framework and get much better utilization out of the systems. If we want to, to give hints to the scheduler to say, I actually want this to be a data node and this to be an ingestion node. You can do that as well through, through DCOS and Mesos through what's called a placement constraint. So I can say, uh, or if I don't want two Kafka brokers to land on the same machine, I can give it unique host constraints. So only run this on one machine. So you have a lot of flexibility in how you do that, but it's much easier to deploy within DCOS than it is to try to do it on your own. Yes, sir. So the question is, are the extensions we wrote for Spark open source? So they're not, so unfortunately, uh, there is some, a couple samples uh, in the, the repo that talk about how to use our open source. We do have an open source library that's, uh, it's called GIS tools for Hadoop, but it also works with Spark. Uh, and so we have a couple examples. I think there's five or six operators that do geospatial things with Spark. There's no user-defined types. It's only user-defined functions. Uh, but that's a good starting point. And there's, there is an app in this repo that uses that to do like a geofence detection. So tell me when this enters this area. Uh, and so if you wanna get a basic example of that that you could expand further, you could take a look there. Yes. So the question is, have you done anything with auto scaling? So we haven't yet. Uh, so the way we deliver these things right now is a managed service. So we deliver it for a customer and we kind of manage it for them. And so we monitor it and have humans involved to, to do scaling and things. It wouldn't be hard to, to add auto scaling and there's some new capabilities coming in DCOS that'll help with that. Uh, but uh, having good instrumentation is super important for all this. So uh, a lot of times when you see talks about DCOS and, and monitoring, it's all about what's the container CPU and what's the RAM doing. But when you build a higher order application like this, it's really important to think about what are the application metrics that I wanna do. So it's more about how many bytes per second am I streaming through the system or how many, uh, how many car uh, observations have I received and I know that I'm supposed to expect 100,000 to 200,000 events per second. 
And if I get something drastically different from that, I need to sound an alarm and see if somebody can do something about that. Uh, or if I'm supposed to have a response time of my map visualization generation sub-second and I'm not getting that, I need to get those stats in. So there's some really cool uh, DCOS metrics capabilities in DCOS 1.9 and later. Uh, and those metrics we actually use to add application level metrics in. So our containers write application metrics into that and then we can hook onto the event bus to receive those around. Uh, so we've, we've built our own kind of uh, things in that and you could use those application metrics, for example, to say, if I've got a connected car feed coming in and there's a topic for Audis or whatever it is, then if the Audi topic is growing and my Spark streaming jobs aren't keeping up. I want to auto scale more instances of the Spark streaming job. So you could have the infrastructure in place to do that. Uh, we haven't gone to that level yet, but it's certainly possible to do. Yeah. If the question is, do you have stats or metrics on how many uh, megabytes or points per core? You can do that. I don't think we have it by core, but uh, we have it uh, based on, we've been able to scale up to millions of events per second on the sources and the Kafka brokers, and depending on your analytics that you're performing, it'll drastically be different. So if you're doing analysis across geofences and there's 800,000 geofences, that's gonna be different than if there's, and those geofences are, they have 300 edges on them, then that's gonna be drastically different than if it's just rectangles and there's 10 of them. Uh, so it kind of depends on the analysis that you're doing and it's, it's kind of dependent on the application. Uh, but we certainly do capacity plan and help customers with their use cases to do that. Uh, the geofences also can be dynamic as well. So it could be uh, Ricardo's walking around and I want to generate one of our analytics tools can create a service area where the service is where can Ricardo walk in one minute. And so he gets a polygon around him and I have a polygon around me and I want to know if those two polygons ever intersect. So in that case, the polygons are drastically changing all the time, because every time I move, I get a new polygon. So with those types of scenarios, it, you get less events per second because the polygons are constantly moving around and things of that nature. So it really depends on the, the use case, but we've been able to scale this up to millions of events per second, and it takes you know tens or so of, of nodes to do that. It took like 10 Kafka brokers to get to millions of events per second. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question, great comment. So uh, the question is, what are you doing? Are you doing stateful processing in your real-time analytics? And if you are, what are you doing for that? So that's a problem we haven't yet solved. So we, in our traditional product, we do stateful streaming analysis. So we wanna know when Adam enters this room. If I need to know when Adam enters this room, I need to know his last position and his current position. And so uh, being able to do stateful processing is relatively easy to do. Being able to do reliable stateful processing is very difficult to do. And so that's a problem we're still figuring out is how we're gonna do that with reliability uh, on that. Cause we need to, there's, there's a number of factors like uh, if you do that in a Spark streaming job, you need to actually have the partitions and Kafka such that you get the same track ID on the same Spark streaming job so that I know that. And so that's one way to start with that. But if that Spark streaming job fails, you wanna be able to have that state on the other Spark streaming job that picks up that partition after that. So that's a harder problem of how do you actually synchronize that? And if you do that, how does that affect your throughput? And so there's a number of factors to consider. Uh, given that, we have, we've prioritized our stateful streaming stuff less and our customers have actually been accepting of that. Uh, the way that we've kind of compensated for that is our batch analysis capabilities can be scheduled on a regular basis. So if they wanna do stateful processing, they actually do that every 30 seconds, every minute, run a batch analytic or a Spark job and calculate and detect those things and send that out. So it's typically acceptable that there's a 30 second latency between those alerts happening. So that's how we've compensated and how we've avoided having to solve that problem. So it's a great question and a very difficult problem we spent years on. Yeah, yeah, so the batch analysis, so Spark streaming jobs write the data into Elasticsearch and then our batch jobs use metronome and they basically schedule themselves every 30 seconds, every minute, run, detect when Adam's entered something. And so that way it doesn't really matter which Spark streaming job processed it. 
Uh, and so that's the reliable way that we can do that. And if data comes in late, we can compensate for that as well, which is another problem. So when you're dealing with streaming uh, state in a stream. Okay. Yeah. We got time for one last question. All right, who wants the last question? Uh, I'll take So the question is, how do you deal with out of sequence things and, and something goes down? So that's another reason why we've kind of compensated with a recurring batch analysis capability. And so somebody needs to be thoughtful about how latent can something be. And so if it's gonna be, you know, a 50 minute latency potential, then you wanna run that every hour as opposed to that so you can try to fit it in. So there's always gonna be circumstances where something comes out of order. So maybe somebody turns their phone off and it kind of queues up the events so that when they get connected again, it distributes everything, and all of those come out of sequence because they get processed in parallel. So that's a better way to do it is to actually do recurring analytics on, through a batch recurring analytic task that's running. And so Metronome or Kronos are, are very good at doing that type of thing. All right, I think that's all the time we had. So. All right, thanks, Adam. I'll stick around in the hallway. Thank you, guys. So we've got